Well, welcome to church this morning. It's so good to see you. Uh, it's my favorite time of the week. It's the beginning of a new week and no better way to start it than by turning our eyes upon Jesus this morning. Please, I think we have, everybody's got a seat. Um, if you have uh, empty space, just make room. But I want you to, I'm sure you do notice, uh, one of the unusual things about this church is we have a lot of young people up serving and singing with us. And that's not by uh, happenstance. So Katie does such a great job cultivating musical talent in our youth ministry. And we thank uh, Mark and Kimberly for their constant efforts in our youth ministry. But we now have three different youth bands, which is amazing. Uh, there are more, there's more musical and vocal talent in our youth group than in most churches. And so we're seeing that uh, rise up into this place and going from barely playing to playing better to leading in a service like this, which is no small thing to get up here and play an instrument before this crowd. And so we praise the Lord for that. Um, it's a significant commitment for a young person to, to pledge five hours of their Sunday to come and pray, uh, to sing and lead. Because they get here early and they stay late and they play for both services. And so I just thank God for what he's doing and our young people and each of you that are playing. We just thank you so much for that. We're going to be in First Peter this morning. Uh, the same passage as last week, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, but I will be focusing on verse 16 this morning, which has to do with the holiness of God. And so while you're turning there and finding your place, I would ask you, has there ever been a time or a period of time in your life where you have been overwhelmed, where you have become uh, very aware in an awe-inspiring way of the presence and the nature of God. That something about the holy reality of the risen Christ has struck you in a way where you become very aware of the reality of God. And as we'll see this morning in this passage, every time that we become very aware of the nearness and the presence of God, we also become very aware of our own sinfulness. And that's because God is holy. And we become very aware of his righteousness and his perfection. We cannot help but become aware also of our own sinfulness and the great disparity between who God is and who we are. And this is what makes us call out to the mercy of the Lord Jesus that we might be forgiven by him and rejoice in his forgiveness and in his kindness. So for Peter himself, who writes this letter, the Mount of Transfiguration was that time for him, the first time for him, a very unique experience for he uh, and James and John, and he talks about it in his first chapter of his second letter. For me, this first sort of overwhelming period like this was in college. And I went to college, I uh, went to a secular university, and I moved straight into a dorm that even 15 years ago was a, a uh, a co-ed dorm, it basically, that equals chaos is what it was. It was just people living everywhere, doing anything that they wanted to do. And I would get up early in the morning just from a great sense of feeling called by the Lord to spend more time with him. And there was nobody up early in the morning in the lobby. And the Lord met me so many times there in the lobby of that dorm in my freshman year in college and made me very aware of his presence and his work and gave me a hunger and thirst for righteousness and ultimately a calling of ministry from that period of time. But when we become aware of the presence of the Lord, we are becoming aware of his holiness. Please stand this morning as we honor the Lord to read his word. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded... Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But he who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. You shall be holy, for I am holy. God has been revealing his holiness throughout history. And so much of the Old Testament relates to revealing and making known to us the work of the holiness of God. 
And so today's mandate, moral mandate to you and to I to be holy because the Lord is holy flows from the holy character of God. So we are called to walk in a way that is consistent with the character of God. And I'll remind you from last week, to be holy is to be set apart. And the holiness of God and the same holiness that God is calling you and I to is to be set apart from evil, but yet set apart to righteousness. So we're set apart from things that are evil and we're set apart to righteousness. So the first part of this morning, I want to cover four examples of the display of God's holiness. And we'll get as far, I'm not going to rush this, so we'll get as far as we can today. We're going to break for the Lord's Supper. If I can't get through all of this and if I can't get through all of it, we'll pick up and keep going next week. Four examples. The first example of a display of God's holiness, the first major example, in my opinion, in the Old Testament, is Moses and the burning bush. When you turn to Exodus chapter 3, we have Moses who has been driven out of Egypt and is living in the wilderness and is an older man at this point in time and is shepherding. And he happens to be on what becomes known as the mountain of God, a special place in the world. And as he's shepherding his sheep, he comes across this bush that is burning but is not consumed. And he says, what is this? What is happening here? So he goes over to this bush and fire, as we know all throughout the Old Testament, is a very common way of the Lord displaying his presence. Something that is uh, beautiful, something that is full of heat, but something that is displays the unique qualities of God in many ways. And so he describes himself as a consuming fire at one point in the scriptures. But here we have this fire burning, but not consuming this bush. And Moses goes over and gets near to it. And the Lord God speaks to him. And one of the things he says to Moses, is he says, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. What an interesting thing. It's not that the the bush was holy, it's that God was there and he was displaying his presence in a peculiar way to Moses. And as Moses drew near to God and was aware that he was very near to God, something had to be changed. It was not business as usual. You say, well, what is so specific about him taking his sandals off? I'm not sure there really is anything special about him taking his sandals off, but it's that he must change the way that he came into the presence of God and his every day working as a shepherd. He needed to do something to show that coming into the presence of God was now different than the everyday shepherding work. And so he takes off his sandals and recognizes that he's in the presence of God and something very different is happening here. The holiness of God. God was there with Moses in a special way. And when God is present with us in such a special way, it becomes a sacred space or a sacred time. And that word itself is something that is very lost in our day and age. For something to be sacred means that it is set apart for a specific purpose. When we draw near to Christ Jesus and there becomes a sacred nature to our life, there's something that's set apart. There are certain times of the week. This time, this Sunday morning time is a sacred time. It's a time set apart for what we're doing right here. We don't book other things on top of this because this time in our week is sacred to us. And we set it apart for the Lord God. And it is the boundaries are around it. No, I'm sorry, I'm busy on Sunday morning. That's a time that I give to the Lord. It's a sacred time in my week. And so when the Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, when the Lord God comes near to Moses in this sacred space, he proclaims his holiness and he acts differently in the presence of God. And it's something recorded for us in scripture. And he communicates to Moses what he wants for him to do with the people of Israel. Well, another one, if we jump forward to Exodus chapter 19, after the Exodus, after Moses has gone through with what the Lord calls him to do to lead the people out of slavery, we end up three months after the Exodus at Mount Sinai, the same mountain, the mountain of God. And here the Lord reveals himself to the people so that they may believe In Exodus chapter 19, verse 10, again, we get to this sacred nature of coming near to the Lord. 
And so the Lord tells Moses, I'm getting ready to visit the people in an unusual way that I have never visited them so that they might believe in me. And you need to consecrate yourself. And he goes through a series of ways he wants them to wash themselves and things like this, much related to the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. But the purpose of those things was to prepare the hearts of the people to realize we're passing from normal everyday life into some special time with the Lord. And when we pass into a special time with the Lord, we don't just mosey right on in. And that's where I, when I often talk to you about preparing your hearts for this place, it's best if we can not just tumble through the door into this place, but if we can on Saturday nights and on Sunday mornings do something to prepare our hearts to enter into this place, to say, Lord God, I want to hear from you. I want, my, I want my heart to be right before you. And we come into this place consecrated or having taken actions to prepare ourselves to be with the Lord, the, the, the heart the ground of our heart is more fertile because we have prepared ourselves for that time. And there's many different ways that we could talk about this, but we have a little picture of it here that the people are consecrating themselves according to the Lord's command so that when they come into this special audience of the Lord, that their hearts might be prepared for what is getting ready to happen. And so there's a difference of action when the people come into the formal presence of the Lord. And I want to read to you from verses 10 through 25, a very powerful passage of Scripture, if you've never read it, about this meeting of the Lord God with the people of Israel after the Exodus. Verse 10, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to begin with verse 16. Verse 16, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings in a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord, to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who comes near to the Lord, consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. And then we end up with chapter 20. If you're familiar with Exodus, Exodus chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. So right on the heels of this awe-inspiring display of God's glory and grandeur and the separation of himself from sinfulness... And I have to point out this whole thing with the trumpet. It's absolutely fascinating. It says there was a loud trumpet blast, like a continuous blast of a trumpet that keeps getting louder and louder and louder until it becomes terrifying to the people. I, my sense of that is something like a, you know, a giant train horn that just gets so loud. You're like, what is happening here? And it is some, it's something that's coming from heaven that is bringing fear and awe amongst the people that God himself has arrived on this mountain. And we should note that this idea of a trumpet blast is not unique to Mount Sinai. When the Lord gave instructions to the people for what I'm going to talk to you next about the temple and the tabernacle, he said he gave very specific instructions about creating two silver trumpets, that there might be a trumpet blast when it was time to call the people together to worship at the temple and the tabernacle. 
And if you've got your thinking cap on now, you're also thinking, hey, I've heard something else about a trumpet in Scripture, which has to do with the second coming of Christ. That when the Lord Jesus comes again, there will be a trumpet blast that is sounded from heaven, calling God's people home to himself. There is something amazing and continuous through the scriptures about this idea of a trumpet blast announcing the presence of God coming near unto humanity. And so we have something of the holiness of God in this, a powerful record from all time of God's holiness, of him separating himself, the sacred separation of God and man, and the awareness of our own sinfulness, the people saying, we cannot approach God. He is too separated from us. He is too holy. Well, that's a second example. A third example has to do with the temple and the tabernacle. The the temple and the tabernacle are enduring lessons and examples of the holiness of God for all of the Old Testament. So the tabernacle is the moving version of the temple. When the people were still moving around, a nomadic people, there was a tent version of the temple called the tabernacle. The temple was set in Jerusalem once the people were set. And one of the things about the temple and the tabernacle that's very important is that they are physical displays of the holiness of God. There is a three-part separation of the people from the presence of God. There is this courtyard, and then once they enter into the courtyard, there is an entering into a holy place, and then finally there is an entering into the most holy place, which is where the Ark of the Covenant, where the mercy seat of God was. And so for a person out doing their everyday business, there's three ways, three, uh, what would you say, uh, separations between the holiest place and God himself. And this matters. The most holy place, the one that is most set apart, is the place that only the high priest could enter into one time a year. It's the place where the Ark of the Covenant rested, the place where the the Shekinah glory of God was made known, the dwelling place of the glory of God amongst humanity during that period of history. This ark of God was something that was never, ever to be touched by people. That's why there were long poles put through the sides of it so that they could be carried without it being touched. And there's records of those that touched it uh, dying because of getting too near to the holiness of God. And when we look at all of this, you know, you read there's chapters and chapters of how to build these things. It was meticulously, both structures, meticulously designed by the particular command of of God. You, know, you read through these chapters, and you're like, man, this cubit and that cubit and this length and that length. And, you know, for the builders in here, maybe you find that fascinating. But for most of us, it's just pretty tough to get through. Like all the, this engraved and that, and this is this thickness and that height. But what you need to see overarching out of this is that by God's very particular design, he has a threefold division of the sinfulness of man from the the glorious presence of God. And only by certain ways are we entering in to the presence of God. And that coming from outside of everyday life into that courtyard, into the presence of God, means that you're coming nearer to God. It's a time of worship, a time to consecrate yourself because you are drawing close to the holiness of God. You're entering into a sacred space, a space that is set apart for God, not for everyday life. The fourth example that I would like to point out to you this morning relates to Isaiah. It's a vision into the throne room of God in Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, I'm going to read for you the first five verses of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. 
And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And so Isaiah, who was very familiar with the temple and the things that we've talked about already this morning, is given a vision into the throne room of God. And what is proclaimed about God in this throne room is his holiness. And these angels calling out back and forth, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when we look at Hebrew and the Hebrew language, the way in which you reach the superlative sense of the high est or the great est in English, this sense of the greatest of things is to repeat things over and over. And to repeat something three times is for it to reach its superlative sense. And so the great characteristic of God that is being proclaimed by these angels is his holiness, his separation from wickedness and his separation unto righteousness. And in heaven, this perfect place, this is being proclaimed about him. And when Isaiah sees almighty God exalted in all of his holiness, it's not like someone writing about a king that says, oh, this, this king had this golden throne. You can read lots of accounts of, of people talking about the court of a king and being amazed by the things that they see there. But his immediate reaction is to be humbled of his own sin. Woe is me. I am a person of unclean lips. Because being in the presence of God convicts us of our sins. But always we see the mercy of Christ. As we go on with Isaiah 6, which we don't have time today, he is pardoned of his sins as he calls out in forgiveness for what is happening. Immediately, though, Isaiah is aware of his sinfulness. The question that I have for you after just briefly looking at these four examples of the holiness of God in the Bible is, do you understand God like this? Is this the picture that you have of God? Are these things new to you that I'm saying to you this morning? Or have you lost sight of this sense of the holiness of God? Because Peter is calling us to be holy as God is holy. And so for us to understand what it means for us to walk in holiness, we have to first understand who is God and what is he doing? What is he like if we are to walk in his holiness? And so when we see this morning the holiness of God, this, this, this burning bush, this Mount Sinai, this you know, third level of holiness in the temple, and then the holiness of God in heaven, it speaks to us greatly of the transcendence of God, a very high, lofty, and separated view of God. And that is true. However, that great, high, lofty, exalted view of God is part of what makes the incarnation of Christ Jesus so amazing and so beautiful. Because we have the transcendence of God and his holiness, but we have the imminence of God in Christ Jesus who walks among us. How is it that this God, thrice holy, exalted, burning up the top of Mount Sinai, comes down and is born in a lowly place, laid in a stable, in a, in a eating trough of an animal when born to a poor couple, and lives amongst us as God with us, as a common man, tempted as we are, yet without sin, laying his hands on the lepers and the sick and the demon-possessed, that he might proclaim the kingdom of God coming to them. The, the disparity between these two things is absolutely astonishing, really something that we cannot bring together fully. But this is the God that we worship, that he is both transcendent and imminent. And in both of these things, he is holy. For Jesus Christ walked in holiness amongst us when he was on this earth. And so there is a connection between this transcendent and imminent nature when we look at Jesus in Mark chapter 11 and connecting all of this to holiness. I think it's fascinating. When we read in Mark chapter 11 of Jesus coming in riding on a donkey uh, at the, the what we celebrate as Palm Sunday, where the people saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest, worshiping Jesus as he comes in on this donkey. And then he goes into the temple 
And Mark 11 records the clearing of the temple, which is interesting. What we just talked about the temple, this place that is supposed to be what kind of place? A sacred place, a place of worship, a place set aside from everyday things to set our hearts upon the holiness of God. And Jesus comes into this place, and what does it become? It's become a, a flea market with people selling everything, making money, avarice, greed, and he puts a whip together and drives the people out of his father's house and flips over the tables. It's a, right, it's a holy wrath poured out by Jesus on the people that have taken this sacred space and have profaned it. And he drives them out saying, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, not a place of business. And it is a powerful reminder to us of holiness and sacredness overlapping with the world and that these two things ought to be kept separate. And Jesus presses that these things might be returned to their sacred purpose, which is the worship of the Lord God in his holiness. And so what is the significance of the holiness of God today to us? We look back at 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 15 and 16, Peter writes, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. You're going to have to dwell on some of the things that I have said here today as to what this means. But I want to bring some aspect of application to us walking in holiness because God is holiness. The first is that we must be set apart from this world. If holiness means anything, it means being set apart from the, the, the world, the sinfulness of this world. Constantly there are two uh, descriptions used in the Bible, those who are worldly and those who are godly. And the godly are not worldly. There's a separation between the two. One seeks after the fallen things of this world and the other seeks after the holy things of Christ Jesus, those things that are of the kingdom of God and not of this world, which is a picture of people going in two different directions. And when we seek after the holiness of God, we are seeking after the things of God's kingdom. We love not the world nor the things of the world. And our affections, what we love, is not set on the things of this world. All of the various great godly people that we admire in the scriptures did not love the things of this world. They sought after the things of God. They loved the things of the Lord. The godly love the things that God loves. The godly want to be counted with Jesus. They want to leave this world behind. Jesus did not love this world. He was clearly passing through for a purpose, descended and then ascended. And so it is with every person that is in Christ Jesus. We are in this world for a time, but we are like a pilgrim passing through. This world is not our home. Our final citizenship is not here. And we love the things that are of the Lord, and it causes us to live a separated life, separated in the way that we act towards our family in the words that we use, in the values that we have, the pursuits of our life. And so as Jesus said, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. There is something of holiness to us. There is something of separation, not of pride, but of separation. And that all that we do, there is something of Christ Jesus. Secondly, in Christ, we are to seek after sacred and eternal things. This world cares nothing for sacred things. That's why these things have almost been lost in our time. Because the people of our age are so material. They seek after the things of this world and care nothing for the kingdom of God. As Christians, we are to be those that seek after things that cannot be shaken and cannot be lost. We seek after those things that are secured by the cross of Christ for us and the promises of God. We seek after those things that must be sought by faith but produce love and produce joy, and produce hope, and peace, and righteousness in our lives. It is a different fruit than it is produced by seeking after the things of this world, which will so quickly be lost. Because ultimately, we are seeking the presence of the risen Lord Jesus. We are seeking to enter into his presence, to pass through all of these different gates, 
that we might be in the full presence of Christ Jesus. And what is now faith will then be sight. In the pursuit of God's holiness, we are set apart from the world. We are seeking eternal things. And then thirdly, we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to briefly mention this, and this is where we're going to pick up next week. We talked about the holiness in the illustration of the temple in the Old Testament. But the thing that is so astonishing is that in the New Testament, under this covenant of grace, the temple is intentionally done away with. And what happens in the New Testament? The Lord God sends his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to dwell in the hearts of his people. We are told over and over that when we become Christians, when we put our faith and trust in Christ Jesus, that God sends his Holy Spirit to indwell your heart and that you become the temple of the Holy Spirit in, I, in this New Testament age. I'm going to read for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. And we'll pick up with this next week. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial or Baal? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said... I will make my dwelling place among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. And so we have brought together what is happening in the Old Testament and then transitioned into a infinitely better and more beautiful situation and that we are no longer separated by these three tiers of, of curtains and uh, uh, priestly roles. Instead, the Lord God places his spirit, his Holy Spirit, directly in our hearts when we come to Christ Jesus as Lord. And there's much more to say there, so we'll pick up with that next week. But think about these things. Consider these things. And consider what it means that your heart is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That this week we might be a people that love the Lord Jesus, that seek after his kingdom and pray for more of the work of his Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's pray together.